Welcome everyone. We're going to get started here in just a few minutes. Thanks for making it. I see a few more names popping up. Thanks for joining us this evening. We're going to get started underway probably just after the hour. And I see a couple more folks who have joined. Welcome. Thanks for making it tonight. Uh, we're just at the top of the hour here. We'll wait a few more minutes to let folks who had registered for the meeting arrive before we get underway. Hi, for those who've just arrived, welcome. We're still waiting for a few more attendees. Um, we'll get started here in just a few minutes.
All right, I think we're ready to get underway uh, in the interest of time and we may have a couple more folks trickle in, but I think we're seeing just about everyone who had pre-registered. Thank you for that. My name is Ryan Orth. I'm with Enviro Issues and I'll be moderating tonight's session. Uh, along with me are Jackie and Will, uh, who are working in the background. Jackie is running the meeting for us um, and Will is documenting the session. Thanks to you both. If you do have any technical issues, uh, Jackie will be on hand to support you. Um, and I will introduce our panelists here in just a moment. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. Hopefully you can see uh, the presentation that we're casting to you. And um, you know, thanks for joining this virtual public meeting session. Uh, many of you are likely familiar with the features of Zoom. This is a Zoom webinar, so it's a little bit different. So I want to orient you to the tool. Um, uh, I will note that we are recording this session and we will be posting a link to the recording by May 18th on the project's online tool site. Uh, that's where many of you have been entering comments uh, on the design process. Um, closed captions are also available uh, and you can find that uh, feature in your uh, toolbar. So uh, please turn that on if you'd like. Um, you know, we're going to have you in listen mode throughout the presentation, uh, but you will be able to ask a question verbally as we get into a question and answer session. So um, at the bottom of the screen uh, is a Q&A button, and you can submit a question there at any point. Um, this is what it'll look like when that pops up. So you just type in your question there and hit send. That's also where you can reach Jackie if you've got any issues that need resolving. Uh, and I'll be giving some, uh, you know, so you enter your question, I'll be calling on folks and I can unmute you so you can uh, provide your, uh, your, your question to the group. Uh, I've got a few additional ground rules, but I'll go over those as we get into the Q&A portion of the meeting. So with that, why don't we uh, get into some introductions with our panelists. Uh, we have Doug Marsano and Claire Christian from King County and Lieutenant Dan Nelson from the City of Seattle, uh, Seattle Police Department. Uh, Doug, just a couple words about yourself. Sure, of course. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, it's nice to meet with you virtually after emailing you for a number of weeks here. I appreciate your attention. My name, uh, excuse me, my position is the Community Relations Lead for this project, and um, I've been working with interested community members for about the last six weeks since we had a meeting in, in late February about next steps. So looking forward to the conversation. Thanks very much. Claire? Hi, I'm Claire Christian, and I'm the Property Asset Management Program Manager for King County's Wastewater Treatment Department. And I've been working um, with this particular site since about September of 2019. And I'm looking forward to the discussion today and the presentation and to hear everybody's thoughts. Thank you. Go ahead, Lieutenant Nelson. Hi, everybody. I'm Lieutenant Dan Nelson with the Seattle Police Department. I am uh, the commander of the city's uh, SPD portion of the navigation team, meaning that um, we do the on-scene security for the overall ground works with the um, homeless encampments and RV remediation. Um, I've been with the department for about 15 years. Um, and I just started this position about uh, two months ago. Prior to that, I was in patrol operations and our crisis response unit. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you. Uh, so you see Jackie's name down there. I should mention also Rachel Winters uh, is providing closed caption uh, for this meeting. So thanks, Rachel. And um, uh, I want to acknowledge that there you know, are folks who may have questions about topics that we aren't covering during this public meeting. So uh, you'll see here a number of additional contacts that you may connect to. This presentation is going to be posted to our online site as well. Um, so don't feel like you need to jot all these uh, emails or numbers down now, um, but you can reference that. And that's where you can get more information and direct responses about the city's 
uh, response, uh, response to the homelessness uh, in the community, uh, the Sandpoint Way bus stop uh, and or uh, traffic uh, sidewalk issues near the pump station facility. Um, our agenda tonight is pretty straightforward. We're just about to get into the presentation. We expect that to be about 30 minutes in length. We tried to reserve the bulk of the meeting for your questions and responses. Uh, we'll wrap up and are aiming to be completed by 8.30 tonight. Um, we're going to take a five minute break at the top of the hour, so at 8 o'clock. So can expect that and we'll use that time to get ready for Q&A and you can sort of digest the presentation and uh, start sharing your questions. So a few goals for this meeting, um, you know, obviously to give you some updates and share more information about uh, the, the pump station and long-term security needs. There's been a, a lot of feedback already coming in uh, to the county so that we want to go over uh, what the county has heard and how they're responding uh, in the ongoing design process. So that's really the topic that we're on uh, and then we'll have uh, a lot of opportunity to listen to your questions and uh, share more about how uh, we're moving forward. Uh, and with that, uh, I wanted to go ahead and hand it off to Lieutenant Nelson for a little more information about homeless response. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, so the city of Seattle started its navigation team uh, roughly three years, a little over three years ago. Um, it's currently uh, managed by the Human Services Department. Uh, they employ um, all of the uh, we call them field coordinators. There's the ones who go out to the each individual encampment site that we get reports about, um, do site assessment, identify, you know, the size and scope, you know, how much litter is present, what type of um, equipment needs to be uh, called to the scene to help mitigate like trash and other issues. They work with um, all the other providers, um, SDOT and everybody else to see if there's any um, roadway repair or things like that. They additionally, they hire what are called system navigators. System navigators are the ones everyone knows that are um, connecting folks to services. So they do outreach and engagement long-term, um, trying to engage people to uh, go into shelters or tiny homes or any of those other uh, community resources. SPD's role is simply to um, go out and support the team's mission and make sure that everyone is safe. Um, I say everyone, I mean everyone being the, uh, the field crews, um, as well as our unsheltered neighbors, and uh, the community around them. So we do everything from traffic, traffic mitigation, if we have to block off some roads so we can get the dump trucks in front of us, or um, again, uh, do some traffic control so people as they're leaving the area can cross the street safely and, and minimize the impact. So essentially that's the SPD's role. Um, all decision-making and everything is handled by the Human Services Department. Um, and we're, again, just trying to support the overall effort. Wonderful, thank you, and thanks for your contributions to the project. Uh, Doug, I'm gonna hand it over to you and to Claire to paint the picture from the county's perspective. Great, thank you, Ryan. So before we dive into the Matthews Park pump station itself, I'd like to start by um, discussing the pump station's relationship both to your neighborhood and the regional wastewater treatment system. So the story starts basically drains in your house. Uh, a lot of us are washing hands quite a bit these days. The soapy water that uh, runs down the drain in your house goes through a pipe that is connected to a pipe in the street that is owned and maintained by the city of Seattle. Likewise, the rain that runs off roads into storm drains also falls into that same pipe that's owned by the city of Seattle. When enough homes and uh, storm drains have filled the pipe, the entire contents of the pipe run into a pipe owned by, the, by King County. That pipe in your neighborhood flows directly to the Matthews Park pump station. Flows at the pump station are then pushed all the way over to the county's treatment plant in Magnolia, the West Point treatment plant. On a rainy day, the Matthews Park pump station 
will send about 24 million gallons of sewage and stormwater to the treatment plant in Magnolia to be cleaned and safely discharged to Puget Sound. The pump station's been doing this in your neighborhood for about 50 years, and it's been a good neighbor for the most part. It works quietly and with little disruption. And this is a good thing. The pump station is a critical piece of infrastructure. It's a critical infrastructure facility that we need to have operate reliably. We want it to work. We all count on it to help keep sewage out of Lake Washington and the park in Thornton Creek. And in order to do so, it needs to be maintained regularly under safe conditions for county workers and of course the public as well. That became more difficult in the fall of 2019. Circumstances on the southeast portion, sorry, southwest portion of the county site, just southwest of the facility, uh, became um, a, the site of an encampment for some unsheltered community members. As, as we heard earlier, my colleague Claire Christian was more involved at that time working with both neighbors and the city of Seattle. So I'd like to turn it over to her to talk a little bit about her experiences doing that work. Thank you, Doug. Hi, um, Claire again here. So I just want to talk a little bit about the background. Um, Doug uh, was in touch with some of the community members in the fall of 2019. And at that time, uh, Doug handed the communications over to me. Uh, part of our program with the property asset management is securing sites, uh, clearing sites of debris, um, of unauthorized users, of um, graffiti and anything else that uh, may be an issue uh, for our operations staff, for the community, and um, for the public. So once we had contact from some of the neighbors expressing concern about safety and security due to the activity at our site uh, with the trespassing, we started taking actions to collaborate with the city of Seattle, uh, with the navigation team, and also with uh, the team that cleans up sites so that we could clear the site. Um, we did have some, the, the encampment was tapping into um, power at our pump station site. And uh, so we had some safety issues with those types of things. And um, the best way for us to secure the site was by fencing it, which is what we took steps to do as soon as we could and collaborated together with the city in order to do so. The fact was that until we could fence, um, clearing the site would not have uh, worked because we would clear it or the city would clear it. And then without fencing it, we'd just have the same situation again. Um, I do wanna be clear about the fact that um, this site is owned by King County Wastewater. It is not a part of the park. Um, it's actually one of our working facilities. It's not a public access facility. I know there's a park adjacent, but this actual site that we have fenced um, is actually a wastewater treatment facility that's an operational facility. And our staff is on site. Um, they maintain the site and, um, and the building, of course, and keep the critical infrastructure working. So uh, anyway, we had the fence installed, the site cleared and fence installed in December of 2019. And I, after that, I think is when, um, Doug, I think you uh, stepped back in when we, we got some feedback from the community about the fence that we put in to just get the site secured. I mean, it was, let's do it as quick as we can and just uh, temporarily or whatever it was gonna be, we had to get it fenced, so that's what we did. So now I think we're here to talk about the long-term. So that's what I've got. Thanks, Claire. So um, as Claire mentioned, we, we put up fencing in, in late December or may, you know, middle December to deter the problem. Um, and we knew by February that we understood and shared the community's interest in more security at the site. And we also understood the operational needs of the site, that we needed the site to be safe for workers. We needed to deter, deter vandalism, make sure there was safe space for use of heavy equipment and to make sure that the equipment we intended to maintain was actually there and intact. So we knew this information, but we clearly needed to know more about the community's priorities and preferences for the site's long-term security. Again, the fence that we installed initially was meant to address a very, you know, a very aggressive problem we had at the time. And we recognized the need to refine to make sure we can fit in better over the course of this facility's long, 
long-term lifespans. So that was the next step. And the site committee, excuse me, the site visit that we had in February was a great next step in our work with the community. We really appreciated Council, Demba Council Member Dembowski and uh, Council Member Juarez's attention and interest in this. It was very helpful to be able to meet with interested members of the community who had uh, a perspective to share with us on what the future of the site's security should look like. And we were eager to get to work. Uh, we had a meeting in March scheduled for a longer discussion about this project. And unfortunately, COVID intervened. And as, as all of you know, public events like that have been shut down for quite a while now. We didn't want to lose steam on the project, so instead we opened up an online module for about six weeks. It was available from uh, early March into April, and I know some folks had problems accessing it at times. I want to apologize for that. We hope that the ex expanded period from in which to comment um, was available to everyone who wanted to participate. Uh, in the end, we had over 600 views on the module. We had 20 people vote with their prefer preferences. They left 95 specific responses and 40 comments with specific feedback. So we were really appreciative of what we heard and we'd like to review what we heard with you now. Okay, so the first question that the community answered was about its top priorities for the site's security. The suggested priorities came from feedback we received at the February meeting. People in the online module could offer other priorities, but these were the five top priori priorities identified. When we asked folks to rank their priorities, the two leading priorities became clear. First, people wanted to make sure there was less of a chance of future encampments. And second, and just as, it's not even second, it was, it was equally important to folks that the security system we use fit in better than the current fence does. We also heard that the other priorities that had been identified at the meeting in February remained important, so we kept them in mind throughout this process. Now that we had a better idea about the community's priorities, we wanted to ask the community's preferences about how to meet them. So the first thing that we wanted to do was make sure that uh, we presented examples of other security systems that had worked at similar sites at other WTD facilities. And by similar sites, what I mean is facilities that we have that are located near popular public places like the park, near trails like Burke Gilman, near busy streets with transit like Sandpoint Way, and also, of course, close to homes. So the, the options that we showed you were uh, concrete fencing that we used at the West Seattle pump station, a combination of fencing with anti-climbing hardware and clear sight lines that we use at North Beach and Fremont facilities, some darker colored fencing with anti-climbing hardware and barbed wire that we use at the Alki facility, and darker fencing with low growing plants that we use at the Rain Rainier wet weather station. We asked community members uh, which of these options made the most sense for use at Matthews Park. There was pretty strong and uniform support for using a combination of anti-climbing hardware fencing and clear sight lines to the extent that we could, and to prioritize using a darker color fence. One clear takeaway for sure was that there was very little support for using concrete fencing. So that's where, we, that's where we started to move forward with that information and understanding the preferences and the priorities. So the next step for us was to make sure that we integrated the information we'd taken and made sure that it matched the goals that we had for the overall project. We never wanted to lose sight of the fact that overall what we needed to do with this project is protect worker safety, protect the neighborhood's public safety, and public health and protect the environmental health of the area too by doing what we could to ensure that the stream didn't become, or excuse me, the creek didn't become uh, a place for refuse and trash. So in thinking about that overall goal, we wanted to make sure we could meet the operational needs of the site, that we could reflect the community's priorities, that we could use the community's preferred options, and that we could install it all by um, this summer because that was a goal we had sort of set for ourselves at the February meeting and we wanted to do our best to live up to that goal moving forward. So 
What I'm gonna show now are some slides on the proposal itself, so let's take a look. All right, I'm going to slide through um, a number of slides here. And in this slide, I'm gonna be talking about uh, the portion of the fence that runs where the bright yellow line is, so north of the site and to the east of the site. These are heavily wooded areas. And in this, uh, this portion, we propose using the current design, which is a galvanized fence with um, barbed wire and anti-climbing hardware called bird barrier. Um, that's like little thorns, steel thorns on top of the, the fence. Um, this is the most aggressive fencing we would have in the entire design. And we have it in these places for a number of reasons. First of all, it's heavily wooded areas with very little visibility to other people. You can't see the back of the pump station from the trail. You obviously can't see it from the park and you can't see it from Sandpoint Way or 93rd Street. So this is a very secluded area which makes it more likely to be a target for folks trying to get in. Therefore, we wanna make sure we beef up the security in that area. It's similar to security we've used at Alki, which is out in West Seattle, also near a busy street, houses and a popular trail. But since it's out of sight and away from homes and paths, we believe this gives us our best chance at deterring climbing in this area. If we could, can you see the next slide? I guess you guys can. Okay, so the next slide talks about the, uh, proposal we have for the western side of the facility along Sandpoint Way. Here, we propose using a darker chain link fence, similar to what we've used at North Beach and Fremont, different sites that also are by bus stops and busy streets and public, public spaces. Uh, we would continue to use the bird barrier, and if you look at the um, inset photo there, you can see the little thorns I was mentioning before, but the barbed wire would go away and the structures holding the barbed wire would go away. So we would have a darker fence with the bird barrier on top to deter climbing. We would also be able to move this fence line in closer to the facility to create more space for waiting at the bus stop. So this is gonna give us a less severe approach that, and look than it is there now. Uh, it'll be set back so we have more room for the bus stop and the darker coating will reduce or hopefully eliminate glare at night, which I know has been caused by some of the street lights. So we can move to the next section. The last section I wanted to talk about was the southern portion of the facility along Northeast 93rd Street. In this area, we propose using a dark anti-climb fence that doesn't have anti-climb hardware along the top. This is a different kind of fence that allows more clear sight lines through it than does a chain link. It's the least severe option we have it will hopefully draw more attention to the wooded area behind it and allow clear sight lines through it, but it still gives us protection from access into the site uh, from this area. As I mentioned, it's the least severe looking, and again, using the dark coating, we're hoping to reduce or eliminate glare at all from the fence. So those are the three uh, prongs of the approach. Um, we think taken together, they give us a great opportunity to meet all of the operational needs as well as the community priorities. We'll be able to secure the site in a way that fits in better. Uh, it will reduce glare. Uh, it won't be as severe looking. And it will also, just as importantly to the community, is reduce the chance for more encampments. Similarly, it will allow our teams who are out there sometimes at night and after hours to have a safer work environment and will protect the facility itself from vandalism or theft. The one area where we weren't able to fully accommodate community priorities is with uh, fully restoring access to the creek for water quality monitoring. That will still be available at the bridge, but it's just not gonna be an option to allow people to uh, roam along the creek bed to take water quality sampling through the site anymore. So uh, we regret that, but um, overall we feel like we're able to meet a lot of the goals that the community had for the um, security system and we believe we can begin work to get this installed on the schedule that we discussed earlier in February to have something in place early this summer. So Ryan, that's, that's what we have. If people want to take some time to digest what um, we propose and then we can have some additional time for question and answer. Yeah, thanks Doug. Uh, appreciate all that information and I realize there's a lot there. Um, but now we do want to take a break. Um, we're going to uh, go away for just 
turn our video off for a few minutes here. We'll plan on coming back at 7.35. So it's about seven minutes as I'm reading it. Um, so please get up, um, you know, uh, take care of yourself. And we'll be back at, uh, at 35 after. We'll spend just a moment reviewing how to use the tool and how we'll conduct the Q&A. And then we'll start taking your questions. But if you want to go ahead and jump in now, I see that there's already a couple of questions in the queue. Um, we'll, we'll start looking at those and be ready to respond. Thanks, everyone.
All right, welcome back, everyone. You might be able to see me a little bit better. As the sun was coming in my window, I had shut my blind and uh, had the lights off, so it was starting to fade away. Um, but here I am. Uh, thanks again. Hope you got a little break. Um, so for this portion of the meeting, um, thanks for the questions that have started to roll in. Just wanted to remind you that you can uh, populate a question at any point using this handy button at the bottom of your screen. Um, so what I'm going to do is be calling on individuals and I'll unmute your line so that you can go ahead and ask your question uh, you know, in your own words and you may have some other context for that which is totally fine. Um, I just ask that you limit your speaking to say a minute or less uh, so that we have time for everyone's questions. We're um, you know, going to allow any clarifying follow up if you have it that is directly related but if you have a different question or um, you know, want to switch topics, we ask that you, um, you know, submit that separately and we'll return to you um, after hearing from others. And really the purpose of tonight is to address questions that are directly related to the design proposal from King County. We're not here to take general comments. If you do have comments, we're certainly interested in hearing them. Um, and we want to um, accommodate those. Uh, we have our live online site where uh, that would be a good place to send them. Of course, you can always send them directly to the county as well. And we'll be sharing Doug's contact info uh, at the end of the session if you don't already have it. Um, so once we've uh, uh, moved on to the next question, I'll, I'll switch the controls here and unmute the next person. We are committed to wrapping up in about an hour at 8.30. So I just wanted to mention that if we are getting into a lot of discussion and at 8.30, we still haven't exhausted all of the questions that you have. Um, I want you to know that we do have your email addresses because you registered here and Doug, thank you, is committed to responding uh, to those questions directly via email next week. And we'll also include those questions and his email responses in the meeting summary that we'll be producing and posting. So just wanted to clarify how we will uh, wrap up and um, start to conclude the meeting at around 8.25 as we uh, talk about our next steps. So with that, um, ready to move on to uh, our first questions. And so let me just make sure that I've got that here. And I think it is uh, Nikki, if you've got a question that you wanted to pose, I'm going to unmute you here. Should be able to go ahead and, uh, and speak. Uh, my question is just about the, the people, the homeless people who've been using the park area, the, not the park, but your area, and what's gonna happen to them? Wh where do they go? What, do they, what happens when all of a sudden they see a fence and they cannot enter anymore into the area where they had been calling home? <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. So I'll go ahead and take that. Um, so currently there is not uh, any encampments uh, in the area. Um, previously, well, what happens is when we get reports of encampments, um, like I was saying earlier, is the entire, the field coordinators, the entire team goes out and does an assessment to figure out, again, the size and scope of what the encampment is. Um, during that time, we have our system navigators with us and officers who have additional training and we do active engagement and outreach to figure out what exactly the needs are. Um, sometimes, I mean, it's a whole wide range of needs. Some folks who are, um, again, our unsheltered neighbors are um, living with uh, substance abuse disorders or um, pretty significant mental health disorders. And that's going to inform what type of shelters that we can offer and um, would be appropriate for them. Um, we don't, the, the Seattle Police Department does not keep any data on anything um, post outreach. We do track, um, you know, where the encampments are, how many uh, folks who were at the encampments, what type of encampments were they RVs or the shelters or did they actually build structures. We'll keep data on that, but all of the um, specific identifying information on the, again, uh, unsheltered uh, neighbors are, that's all housed in a human services department data, and we don't have any way to follow up on where they went. Um, I do know we do, uh, a lot of referrals and serves in the last couple of weeks, we've referred probably about 70 people either into tiny homes or into camp shelters that offer um, counseling applications. So they 
offer substance use disorder treatment and um, beds and mental health treatment and a variety of other services. And sometimes people are, are fine, they just need somewhere to go. And so that's where County Home is becoming more appropriate. Or again, in wake of COVID, um, we're offering uh, at times um, hotel vouchers and things like that. So it, it really is a variety of different options that we're offering folks, but that's not data that has to be. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks, Nikki. Um, so our next uh, question is actually a comment and I'll just go ahead and read that off. Um, it's from Dan Keefe, who says that Thornton Creek Alliance's new water quality sampling site it's just downstream or just downstream from the bridge is working out just fine. So no issues there. I just wanted to report that out. Thanks, Dan, for that. All right, uh, we've got a question from Bill Blake. Uh, Bill, let me uh, pull you up here and I'll let you go ahead and ask yourself if I can unmute you here. Hold on just a second. Bill, I'm sorry, for some reason it's uh, not letting me unmute. Jackie, are you able to, oh, there we go. Bill, go for it. It just said unmute myself. Oh, well, there you go. Um, <clears throat> so, by all means. <laughs> just follow directions. Uh, my question is would it be possible to move the fencing along Sandpoint Way and 93rd further back off the respective roads? Uh, from the, the maps you were working from, it looked like the fences were still pretty much at the extremes of the, the property limits of the site. Um, hi, Bill, uh, Claire, Christian here. I'll um, start off with an answer to that question and then I'll probably have Lieutenant Nelson help out with that answer. Um, that is a critical area there in by the creek and the stream and in order to potentially bump the fence back in, especially along Sandpoint Way. Uh, there's a lot of topography issues and um, trees that most likely would have to come down and whether or not as a county, as we, we would have to apply for permits, I don't know whether we could take them down in a critical area. If we needed to do that uh, and that was possible, um, it would also then likely create less screen of our actual physical building and such that's located there. So that would be more visible from um, the street. And then, I, so I think our plan is to definitely bump it back where the bus stop is to create more space there. And um, when it comes to along 93rd, uh, I think I'll, um, have Lieutenant Nelson speak to this, but uh, part of our concern uh, based on past experience we've had at other facilities is that oftentimes um, people when they're looking for shelter will shelter up against a fence and uh, the more space we would provide for that or, or have available for that, whether it's grass or up, up against the fence could create um, encampments again, but just up against the fence instead of where they were before. So if, you, if you're if uh, you willing to take that, Lieutenant Nelson, from there, um, um, that's what I've got so far, Bill. Absolutely. Um, yeah, just to echo what Claire was saying is uh, anytime you have an abutment period of part of the property um, and people can set up a tent or an encampment, they're gonna go ahead and do so. So um, as uh, you know, Doug and Claire have mentioned that this is a, a critical infrastructure site, like we need it to be moving it as a very important mission. And so we're trying to design, at least my, my suggestion is to design the fence to uh, support smooth operation at that site. Um, additionally, um, we did have an issue, obviously you're all very familiar, you live in the area with um, pretty large encampments in the, in the space. This seems to have um, seriously mitigated that and um, I would encourage you to uh, 
um, keep the current lines um, as, as best you can. I understand we're moving it back to accommodate for the bus stop, but as much as you possibly can to, um, again, continue mitigating the encampments because that's going to improve the overall quality of the, of the neighborhood. So. Do you have any further questions, Bill? Or did, did no, no. For you? you answered it. I had a feeling that's probably the answer I was going to get, but fine. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Thank great. you. Thanks, Bill. Um, I am not seeing other questions pop up at this time, so want to encourage folks to submit those uh, as you have them so that we can get you in the queue here. And we'll, we'll hang out uh, until we see some pop up. All right, well, um, maybe while we're waiting for more questions and as you're thinking of them, um, Doug, we could just talk a little bit about the next steps uh, here, sure. uh, just so that folks have a sense of the process and um, timeline, and maybe that will spark some other uh, questions. Sure. I think also it's important, you know, for all of us to remember, this isn't the only opportunity you have to review this information or offer comments or questions. Once um, we've concluded the meeting, we will post it to the online module that's been available and you can review it then. I understand we, we shared a lot of information tonight. I know I sometimes like to have ideas marinate in my brain for a little bit and that's perfectly okay. Uh, this is not the end of the discussion. It's just a step in it and you'll have uh, another two weeks to review design ideas and weigh in with comments uh, before uh, any additional decisions are made by King County. So just to go over next steps, uh, we'll have this meeting and a summary posted in the online module next week. I will send the online module back out to everyone so that folks who maybe couldn't make it tonight but are interested in the process have a chance to review materials too. Like I said, you'll be able to offer comments uh, and additional thoughts after tonight, if, if you so choose. We'll keep the uh, comment period and the online module open through the end of the month. And then um, after we have uh, closed that portion down, we'll work in June to begin uh, finalizing what the design elements are gonna be and making sure we understand cost estimates and scheduling. You know, there, there are a lot of wrinkles right now when it comes to trying to schedule work. So uh, we wanna see what we can do to to get in line you know, early for, for services like this and then report back to you all on, on what's to come and when. So that's sort of the way forward. Uh, we certainly still have a goal to have something in place that is you know, aligning with the, the priorities that you've established and the security needs that we have in the summertime, but there's obviously a contingency involved with everything that's happening. And we'll keep you posted on schedule and on final results uh, once we have them later in probably in early or mid-June. Thanks, Doug. Sure. <laughs> um, with that, I, I think we are um, still open for questions. Certainly if folks feel like they got what they needed here and wanna move on into whatever the evening holds for them. Um, you're welcome to you know, dismiss yourself, but um, we'll be online until we've got the indication that uh, folks don't have anything else that they uh, want to ask the team at this point. And we'll uh, let you know when we're ready to end the meeting for everyone.
I will uh, flash up your contact info, Doug, for anyone who doesn't have it. Um, and if we don't see more questions come through, just take this opportunity to thank everyone for your time tonight, for stopping by, and uh, hope that this format worked out for you. Always interested in feedback on that as well. I'd also like to thank everyone who's been involved over the course of months that we've tried to connect with folks and, and build a better design that's gonna work for the neighbors and the facility in the long term. King County strives to be a good neighbor. Uh, hearing from our neighbors and, and working with you is a vital part of that. And so we really appreciate everyone who's committed time and thought to this effort and look forward to finding a resolution that's gonna work for everyone. All right, well, I think that we'll just, you know, here we are just uh, 7.51, and I think we'll uh, hold on for maybe three more minutes. Um, if there's anything, any last things coming through before we end the meeting. So if you do have a thought, go ahead and type that in. Otherwise, uh, we will uh, let you go. Uh, so yeah, just about 7.55 or so, we'll end the meeting. Okay, just one more minute. Thanks everyone for your patience. All right, wonderful. Thanks again, everyone, for your participation and uh, have a great night. We're gonna end the meeting now.